Hey everyone, uh, welcome to the PolySci 103 video lecture for this week. Um, as I said before, we're watching this lecture because I'm out of town. First things first, I want to remind you guys, if you haven't already, to sign on to Blackboard and take your, uh, your midterm for this week. I'd be sad if you guys forgot that because we weren't in class. Um, now that I've got that out of the way, I guess we can just get started. This week we're going to talk a little bit about autocracy and the ways that autocratic governments work and try to survive, and then in the end, the way that they eventually decline. We are going to start off by talking about Edward Schatz's article on soft authoritarianism. Um, this article and the first two articles that we cover actually are about how autocratic governments use institutions that seem democratic in order to meet certain purposes to actually repress democracy. Um, so starting off with, with Schatz, Schatz is interested in two countries that probably most of us haven't spent very much time thinking about. Uh, the first is Kazakhstan, represented by President Nazarbayev on the right, surrounded by the blue flag. Uh, and then Kyrgyzstan on the left, that's President Akayev in red. Just to situate this discussion a little bit, in the early 2000s, there were a wave of revolutions that swept through post-Soviet states. These revolutions replaced many relatively repressive pro-Russian regimes with new governments, or sometimes with new regimes, that favored openness and relations with the West. And for those of you who don't recognize this picture, this is from Georgia's Rose Revolution, probably one of the most successful of the revolutions. Um, Georgia today is still relatively open and um, pro-European Union, pro-West. Now, the presidents of many of these post-Soviet states were the former regional heads of these areas under the USSR, or maybe they were their relatives or their successors. So most of these countries, the Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, Latvia, Lithuania, all of these post-Soviet republics, had presidents under the USSR. They had essentially what were like governors in American states. And when these countries became independent after the collapse of the USSR, those governors remained the president of these countries, uh, sort of took them right over. So this is a picture from one of the revolutions that we're talking about in the article. Schatz compares the fates of the regimes in Kyrgyzstan in this picture um, and Kazakhstan during this period. And so because we probably, none of us thought much about these countries, I'll give you a little bit of an introduction to both places. This is Kyrgyzstan, pinned between Kazakhstan and China. And um, this is sort of where it sits in the broader world sort of in this corner between Russia and China. Uh, Kyrgyzstan is really, really mountainous, and it is extremely underdeveloped. It's obviously very beautiful. Kyrgyz is a language and an ethnicity all of its own. About 75% of people who live in Kyrgyzstan are Kyrgyz and speak Kyrgyz. About 75% of the people who live in Kyrgyzstan are Muslim as well. Um, not all Muslims are Kyrgyz, not all Kyrgyz are Muslims, so there's a, quite a bit of overlap, obviously. But uh, as I said before, Kyrgyzstan is relatively poor. It has a GDP per capita of about $3,700, so the average Kyrgyz citizen makes about $4,000 a year. Kazakhstan is maybe slightly more familiar, owing to its unfortunate association with Borat. Uh, Kazakhstan is comparatively flat. This is obviously hilly, but compared to how mountainous Kyrgyzstan is, Kazakhstan actually looks, looks pretty flat and passable. This is Astana, the capital of Kyrgyzstan. It looks modern. Um, it's also super oversaturated for some reason. In every picture that I find of it, it looks like someone filtered it through an Instagram Miami Vice sort of a thing. I don't know why that is. Uh, Kazakh is also a language and it's also an ethnicity. They're related to the Kyrgyz language and ethnicity, although somewhat distantly. As with Kyrgyzstan, about 75% of people who live in Kazakhstan are Kazakh and speak Kazakh, and about 75% of 
the residents of Kazakhstan are Muslim. Now in both Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan, you can see the women are not veiled. Um, so it's a relatively moderate form of Islam. The sort of um, conservative revolution hasn't really come to Central Asia in the same way that it has to the Middle East and to some extent to Southeast Asia. Okay, per capita GDP in Kyrgyzstan is a lot higher or sorry, in Kazakhstan is a lot higher than in Kyrgyzstan, but this is probably because Kazakhstan has massive fossil fuel deposits, and this has made some people extremely wealthy, but there are a lot of parts of the country that are not particularly well developed. Okay, so since we've introduced these two countries, let's let's move on to talk about Schatz's article in a little bit more detail. So there's variation that Schatz finds puzzling here. What is that variation? What is this paper about, really? Um, there are a handful of ways that you might phrase Schatz's question. One is that you might ask why it is that soft authoritarian regimes survive. And soft authoritarianism is different than hard authoritarianism. When you think about hard authoritarianism, these are countries like uh, Iraq under Saddam Hussein, North Korea under the Kim regime, um, Syria under the Assads. Soft authoritarian regimes are a little bit different. We'll talk a little bit more about what these definitions mean in a second, but how do these countries survive is one of Schatz's main puzzles. More specifically, why did Nazarbayev survive in Kazakhstan during this period of upheaval in the post-Soviet republics while Akayev failed to maintain power in Kyrgyzstan? The last way that we might think about Schatz's puzzle or his question is to ask what policies or behaviors it, it was that Nazarbayev used in Kazakhstan that Akayev failed to use in Kyrgyzstan. And how might we generalize whether these behaviors or policies are capable of aiding soft authoritarian regimes to maintain popular support? Okay, so we'll just do a little preview of Schatz's answer quick. Um, Schatz is really concerned with the regime's ability to manipulate the agenda and perception of both the media, journalists, and newspapers, and also opposition parties. Opposition parties are legal in most soft authoritarian regimes. So this is the sort of difference, obviously, we're going to see that um, Nazarbayev in Kazakhstan was capable of manipulating the media and opposition's agenda, whereas Akayev broadly failed to do this. We'll be will be the argument that Schatz makes. Okay, so Schatz considers and rejects a handful of potential explanations for why Akayev's regime is overthrown and Nazarbayev's regime survives. Let's take a look at each of these in turn. Uh, the first is that it's possible that soft authoritarian regimes are given some kind of DNA from where they're born. Uh, it's possible that the state's origins and institutions play a role in how the autocrats defend themselves. We saw last week how different democratic practices lead to different policy outcomes in democracies. The same is true of auto autocracies. So is it possible that there's some sort of DNA or, um, or institutional explanation for why these two regimes ended up with different outcomes, um, the state failure in Kyrgyzstan and, and the state survival in Kazakhstan. Okay, by the way, what kind of theory would this be if it turns out that some states develop institutions that help them survive and other states lack these institutions and therefore fail to survive? Hopefully you answered that it's a realist second image theory. Um, if not, we can talk about that later. Okay, another potential explanation for why Kyrgyzstan fails and Kazakhstan survives is that maybe different foreign powers with different policy goals are capable of interfering. So maybe they interfere in different ways and they can interfere to support or undermine the autocrat. And then what happens is that for some reason, the international powers that be wanted Kyrgyzstan to fail. They intervened for that purpose and succeeded, but they wanted Nazarbayev in Kazakhstan to remain in power. And so they intervened and, and succeeded to keep, to keep him in power. This would be a third image realist theory of this explanation. Another question or another potential theory that might explain the, the variation in outcomes between Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan 
is that the balance of ethnicities is somehow different or the culture is somehow different. And maybe these factors change the cultural willingness to accept an autocracy, or maybe there's a deeper ethnic grievance or a greater likelihood of an ethnic secessionist movement in one country versus the other. Um, and ethnicity in one place senses that fighting against the autocrat is worth it where that same ethnicity or a different ethnic minority in the other place uh, doesn't feel like it's worth it. So this is a third potential explanation for the variation between these two countries. Finally, it's possible that there are geographic factors. Um, perhaps one of these countries is simply very different geographically than the other, and it's easier for insurgents to hide, or it's easier for people to mount a protest because the population is distributed differently. So Schatz claims that his case selection for this paper helps control for all of these different explanations. He makes the argument, essentially, that the cases that he's selected control for these things. There's no variation. So think about how Schatz might go about making this claim. Okay, he makes this claim by arguing that since both countries are Central Asian post-Soviet republics, it would be strange to argue that any of these um, any of these four theories could explain the variation in the outcome. So for example, since both states descended from Soviet institutions, since both states kept most of their Soviet institutions, we might argue that the tools that were available to both Akayev and Nazarbayev were the same. And if these tools are the same, you remember that you can't explain variation with a constant. And since these institutions and transitions and state origins are a constant, it can't explain the difference in the outcome that we see between the two countries. International interference, much the same argument. Since both states are post-Soviet, neither are really on the American agenda or in the American sphere of influence, the interference is likely to be the same. One way that you might critique this idea is that if Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan have different sets of resources, the Soviets might treat them differently. Even though in general the Soviets liked having these successor presidents in charge, it's possible that the fact that Kazakhstan has a lot of oil and natural gas caused um, the Soviets to expend more resources propping up Nazarbayev than they did Akayev, but Schatz claims that this isn't the case. Ethnic or religious background. We already talked about the fact that both countries are split 75-25 between Muslim and other religions, and they're also split 75-25 between an ethnic majority or an, an ethnic majority and a group of minorities. Um, so Kyrgyzstan is 75% Kyrgyz, Kazakhstan is 75% Kazakh. In addition, the 25% that's left over in each country look sort of the same. Um, in each country, this 25% is a mix of Russian ethnicities and other Central Asian ethnicities. So there are actually Kazakhs that live in Kyrgyzstan and Kyrgyz that live in Kazakhstan. So um, Schatz argues that because the balance of ethnicities and religions are the same in both of these countries, it wouldn't be possible to explain the differences in their outcomes by, um, by considering how the ethnicities break down. Now it might still be possible that Kazakh and Kyrgyz are different enough ethnicities that it's, it's the difference in culture that actually drives the difference in, um, in the outcome. But Schatz also makes the argument in the paper that Kyrgyz and Kazakh are similar enough as ethnicities that it probably doesn't make a lot of sense to, to make this claim. Lastly are the geographic factors. Uh, Schatz claims that both of these countries have forbidding geographies, but notice that it's for completely different reasons. Kyrgyzstan is extremely mountainous. Um, there are a lot of parallel valleys that run across Kyrgyzstan that make it difficult to move from one city to the next. On the other hand, Kazakhstan is very, very sparsely populated. There are big cities that are here and there across the countryside, but they're separated by vast, vast um, steps, gigantic plains that stretch hundreds or thousands of miles. So Schatz claims that he controls for geographic factors because in both cases it's very difficult to mobilize, um, mobilize urban groups and rural groups together. Okay, so Schatz is then forced to acknowledge that he, he has some variation in alternative theories that he can't control for. So let's take a look at what those sources of variation are. The first has to do with timing. Kyrgyzstan's revolt happens right as the other flower revolutions are occurring, right as the first Ukrainian revolution, right as the Georgian revolution are starting to take root, 
Uh, a similar revolution happens in Kyrgyzstan. So it's possible that the Kyrgyz government was taken more by surprise and that the Kazakh government had an opportunity um, had an opportunity to think and react. The, the Kazakh uh, attempted revolution doesn't occur until almost a year after Kyrgyzstan's. And so having witnessed the Kyrgyz revolution, having witnessed revolutions in uh, Georgia and Ukraine, it's possible that Nazarbayev was simply able to mount a more effective defense. Second, Schatz, um, Schatz recognizes that Kazakhstan has natural resources that the regime can use to incentivize cooperation. We'll talk about that later. Uh, Kazakhstan has natural resources that invite outside influence and outside investment. And it's possible that this difference is, is what changes um, what changes or controls the outcome variable, what explains the fact that Kazakhstan's regime survives and Kyrgyz, uh, the Kyrgyz regime is overthrown. Okay, but let's get to Schatz's theory and talk a little bit about the elements that Schatz claims are important for controlling the narrative in the way that we talked about in the first slide. Okay, first, he argues that in order to control the narrative, a regime or a government needs to have an actual committed core of support that without these people who are out there generating organic support for your policies, organic support for your narrative, there's no way you're going to manipulate the entire country into believing um, whatever line you're trying to feed them. You actually need to have people who are true believers in your regime who are out there advocating for you organically. Second, you need to be able to use blackmail and enticements subtly, right? Hopefully, you're thinking that this is a little bit of a problem in terms of a standard, right? It's difficult to measure whether the use of blackmail or enticements is subtle. This is always going to be subjective based upon the view of the observer or the view of the researcher. But Schatz claims that he's going to be able to distinguish between subtle uses of blackmail and enticements and those that are completely ham-handed, those that make it pretty obvious that the regime is attempting to repress or hide something. Third, the use of coercion needs to be rationed. And what Schatz means by this, it's another standard or another subjective standard, but what Schatz means by this is that um, a soft authoritarian regime is best off using violence or locking up its opponents only as a last resort. So what we would expect in this case, we'll talk about the hypotheses more later, but what we would expect in this case is that successful regimes, those that are capable of controlling the narrative, are going to jail fewer people, and they're only going to do it when they realize that it's their last resort. Fourth, you need to have a state-run media that has a broad reach and that has regulatory advantages. So state-run media is obvious. You need to have a media company that's controlled by the government that promotes propaganda, or if not propaganda, just a narrative that is positive about the regime and people need to actually watch it. They need to be interested in watching this this news channel or, con or consuming news from state-run media. And one of the ways that you might achieve that is by providing regulatory advantages to those media groups. We'll talk about this in more detail later, but this might involve tax breaks, uh, that might involve legislating you know, uh, bandwidth so that the state-run media gets a guaranteed channel on all broadcast televisions, whereas other media groups maybe have to, you know, only appear on televisions that have more channels like cable news. Um, and then lastly, the last element of controlling the narrative is the most complicated. It is the ability to control discursive moments in politics. So what Schatz means by this is that there are some regimes or some presidents who are capable of influencing how the entire country views particular seminal events. The government can help choose or shape what the nation is talking about. They can, they can direct attention away from some news events and toward others. Okay. We'll talk a lot more about what these discursive moments mean when we get to the actual descriptions of them that Schatz provides, and he provides a lot of detail. But let's go through these elements one by one and talk about um, Schatz's theory. We'll talk, we'll talk about testing Schatz's theory. So what we should expect if Schatz's theory is true is that we should find a committed core of supporters in Kazakhstan that support the Nazarbayev regime, and we should see an absence of a committed core in Kyrgyzstan. 
Schatz argues that this is true. He provides some evidence of the fact that there is a committed core of supporters in Kazakhstan for Nazarbayev. One of the most important pieces of evidence is that there were actually apparently organic student mobilizations in favor of Nazarbayev. In many, many of the flower revolutions and many, many other democratic revolutions, students typically lead the charge for liberalization. They typically wish to remove an autocratic regime that's in power. And, and student mobilization is seen as a very powerful tool for liberalization and democratization. But in this case, it appeared that Nazarbayev had a pretty committed core of supporters and that many of them were students. Another piece of evidence that Schatz references is that there were online portals, um, places where people in Kazakhstan were discussing Kazakh politics, and these places were swamped with pro-government comments. This is in the day before Russians could program Twitter bots that would you know, echo whatever Donald Trump had said and, and broadcast it out through the internet. These sorts of things weren't possible at this time. So Schatz looked at these online portals and claims to have measured the balance of comments that were pro and anti-government and takes his observation that many, many of these comments were pro-government as evidence that Nazarbayev had a committed base of support. This is in contrast to Schatz's claims about Kyrgyzstan. He argued that the government in Kyrgyzstan was so bad at providing policy that everyone knew support for Akayev's regime was low. Another way that he looks for committed core of support and finds that it's lacking is that he argues that whereas in Kazakhstan and in other soft authoritarian regimes, positions of power are dealt out to rivals in order to help pacify them. Uh, in Kyrgyzstan, um, Akayev really failed to take advantage of this opportunity and he put his children in positions of power rather than rivals. So these are rather than direct measures of a committed core notice that the sales pitch Schatz is trying to make here is that there shouldn't be a committed core of support because Akayev has done all of the wrong things to build one. So in, in lieu of being able to measure the size of Akayev's support base, Schatz points to the fact that between the bad governance, which supplies poor policy and poor outcomes to the people, and Akayev's failure to buy off his elite rivals using positions of power, that there's no reason that there should be a base of support. Okay, so on to the next prong of the theory, blackmail and enticements. Again, our hypothesis should be that in Kazakhstan we will see evidence of, um, of a subtle use of blackmail and enticements, where in Kyrgyzstan we should see that the use of blackmail and enticements is going to be ham-fisted. It's going to be pretty obvious to people that, um, that the regime is attempting to use blackmail and enticements in order to cover up its illiberal nature. Okay, so in Kazakhstan, we see that when the students start to become unruly, that base of support that Nazarbayev had, he decides to pay those students off. Um, you know, rather than using straight up coercion, which we'll talk about in the next couple of slides, Nazarbayev pinpointed the students who seemed to be most likely to change student opinion, and he blackmailed or paid off those students. And Schatz says that this is very smart. He didn't buy off students entirely. He went quietly into student organizations and paid off the people that he thought were being the most unruly and against him. Um, another example of Nazarbayev's ability to use blackmail and enticement subtly is the way in which he threatened agricultural firms. So it's important to note that agricultural firms in Kazakhstan are very politically powerful. They have the ability to mobilize their workers to vote for or against the regime. And so Nazarbayev recognizes this, and he recognizes that his base of rural support comes from the support of these agricultural firms and the elites that run them. So rather than threaten these firms directly, rather than blackmail them directly or offer them tax breaks directly, um, Nazarbayev picks uh, a subsidy that's buried in his own legal code and argues that he will take that subsidy away if the ag firms don't back him and he actually manages to win without the ag firms. So he's holding the ag firms hostage with access to a policy that's been in place in Kazakhstan for a long time. And Schatz argues that this is not nearly as visible as providing direct payouts or direct positions of power to ag firm, um, ag firm employees or, or CEOs. The big example that Schatz uses to demonstrate the failure of Akayev to use the Kyrgyz country uh, to generate good blackmail and enticements or to use them subtly 
is that Akayev fails to take the opportunities to raise the money that he does have. Now in Kazakhstan, there's a lot of natural gas money and oil money that Nazarbayev can spread around. And so one of the potential problems here, you'll recall, is that this access to income gave Nazarbayev an advantage. And Schatz says, actually, if you look at the Kyrgyz behavior when it comes to the sources of income they did have, they could have used for blackmail and bribery. Uh, they so abused these opportunities that it suggests that they wouldn't have used more income any better. In this case, what Schatz makes a lot of hay with is the failure of the Kyrgyz regime to raise money by leasing a marine base to the United States. Um, there's a, a really important resupply base in Kyrgyzstan that the Marines use to get in and out of Afghanistan. And it's extremely valuable to the Americans. And, and Schatz argues that Akayev's regime massively undercharged the United States. And as evidence of this, he notes that when Akayev was removed from power and a new regime came to power in Kyrgyzstan, they tripled the price that they charged the Marines. And the new regime used this money immediately to bribe and buy off um, rivals. Okay, third prong of the theory is the rationed use of coercion. Again, we have a hypothesis here, right? We should see the rationed use of coercion in Kazakhstan. We should see relatively few people go to jail. When they go to jail, they should go to jail for reasons other than um, failing to support the regime. In Kyrgyzstan, these efforts sh should again be pretty ham-handed. They should be overbearing and pretty obvious to anyone who's interested in watching what the regime is doing. These are the strategies that Schatz believes prove that Kazakhstan was rationing its use of coercion. Uh, rather than jail rivals, Nazarbayev promised them leniency if they left politics or moved somewhere else. Most people, rather than throwing them in jail, Nazarbayev attempted to bribe. This is different than what happened in Kyrgyzstan. Um, not only was there a lot of punishment, but this was doubly bad for Akayev. Nazarbayev had never promised to be a liberal. He had never promised a democratic opening or any sort of economic liberalization to his people. But Akayev had. So when he started to punish his political rivals, it looked worse for him than it would have even if Nazarbayev had done exactly the same thing. Because it told the Kyrgyz people who cared about liberalization that Akayev was in fact not a liberal. And we'll come back to this again too. This, this bites... Akayev in more than one way. All right, fourth, we have the control of state media. Again, the hypothesis should be that in Kazakhstan, we see a robust state media that gets regulatory advantages, where in Kyrgyzstan, uh, we don't see the same sorts of institutions. We don't see them capable of the same type of, of manipulation in the media. Okay, so in this case, Nazarbayev seemed a lot more savvy about picking alternative stories for state media. He had a state-run media that generated plausible propaganda, and he didn't leverage punishment against independent media. He allowed them to push their own agenda. In one of the examples that Schatz takes most seriously, um, Nazarbayev pulled in Russian observers to certify that his last election had been fair instead of creating a giant conspiracy by asking only members of the Kazakh elite that supported him. The Russians, because they came from outside the country, appeared more neutral and that made the propaganda that the state-run media generated more plausible. Um, in the second element, Nazarbayev only punished independent journalists occasionally. He harassed independent outlets with tax and selective regulatory enforcement, and he provided special advantages to state media. State-run media was channel number two on every television, um, and he auctioned off the bandwidth for other standard channels to entertainment, entertainment outlets rather than news outlets, and he pushed a lot of the state-run media online and onto cable television, and there aren't as many Kazakhs that have access to these independent sources as a result. This stands obviously in stark contrast to what Schatz argues about Kyrgyzstan. Journalists were often thrown in jail, they were often beaten, sometimes they were killed. Papers got closed uh, routinely, journalists were thrown out of the country. And again, this is despite having promised a, lib a liberal regime. So in the circumstances where Nazarbayev in Kazakhstan actually punished independent journalists, you know, he could sort of wink at his audience and say, you know, listen, I never said that I wasn't going to rule with something of an iron fist, so this should be no surprise to you. Whereas Akaev, who had promised to have a thriving independent media, when he closes these things down, it becomes apparent that he's being hypocritical, and it makes it harder for him to control the narrative. 
All right, lastly, let's talk about discursive moments. This is obviously the most confusing just because of the vocabulary, but I think that some of these examples will help clear up what we're talking about with respect to discursive moments. Handful of things. Uh, one of Nazarbayev's favorite strategies was to have his party members, his allies in the Kazakh Congress, create laws that were extremely strict, that cracked down on opposition parties, that made life impossible for independent journalists, that punished people for opposing the regime. And then Nazarbayev himself would make a big show out of vetoing these laws and chastising his fellow party members and saying, listen, you know, we, didn't, we can't have a regime that's this illiberal. We need to allow competition to thrive. Now, of course, the balance of laws that we end up with at the end is still very, very hard on opposition parties and on independent journalists, but because Nazarbayev himself was responsible for vetoing even more draconian law, it makes him look liberal. It allows him to control the agenda. It makes it look like his organs of misinformation and propaganda are less biased. Um, another thing in the article that was maybe a little bit confusing is that at the beginning, in, in the beginning of Kazakhstan's independent existence, there were a number of parties, but way too many parties, dozens and dozens of parties. And so Nazarbayev took the opportunity to outlaw some of these parties, and he made the argument that by outlawing some of these parties, he was actually consolidating an opposition that would be able to challenge him more effectively. You know, he, he essentially called out Duverger's law and said, we have so many parties, most of them aren't going to win. If I outlaw some of these parties or, or pressure some of them to close and consolidate, then I will end up with... Um, a stronger opposition. But of course, what ends up happening is that he takes this opportunity to examine which parties are most likely to be a problem for him. And those are the parties that he outlaws. And he finds ways to co-opt or blackmail the leaders of those parties. And then he gives full freedom to his weakest enemies or those whose agenda is most um, correlated with his own. Uh, finally, he admitted to some amount of limited corruption. You know, he, he made the pitch to his people that government always involves a certain amount of stealing and that he was the least bad. So when his regime would get caught cooking the books with voting or bribing, um, you know, independent journalists or opposition figures out of the state's coffers or using the state's money to run his own election campaign, he argued that this was not as bad as it would be if the opposition were in charge. You know, he sort of winked and nodded. Um, he also made a lot of claims about fake news. When the independent media would run stories, um, he, tended to, he tended to call them fake, and he would push people back into the arms of the state-run media, which because, recall, they had involved themselves in more plausible propaganda, uh, the people were willing to buy. People were willing to, to, to be confused by whether independent media or state-run media was really lying to them, and they sort of gave up trying to figure it out. And so in these moments, um, Nazarbayev was really able to control the narrative. He was really able to sell himself as being a more liberal autocrat than Kazakhs would have if, if they attempted to buck him. This is... Stark contrast again to Kyrgyzstan, um, where we have this sort of direct conflict with media groups. Shot spends a lot less time discussing this, I presume, because um, the data in Kyrgyzstan is much harder to gather. It was harder to observe these things. They were cracking down on independent scholars at the time that Shots was doing his research. Um, but what we see from the outside is that Akayev really attempts to close down media groups instead of coming up with a counter narrative, instead of trying to change people's. Um, instead of trying to switch people's attention to different types of corruption or to the ways in which the, uh, which the opposition was just as bad, engaging in the sort of whataboutist tactics that Nazarbayev did. Um, Akayev just cracked down. He cracked down on media groups, he cracked down on the opposition, and he didn't really attempt to control what people were thinking about through anything other than, than brute force by eliminating the opposing narratives rather than competing with them. Okay, so let's talk about a couple of questions for discussion before I close out this part of the lecture. Um, how convinced are you by Schatz's explanation? 
there must be some strengths and weaknesses to his argument. Schott spent a lot of time living in Central Asia. He knows a lot about authoritarian regimes. There must be something about this, this argument that is interesting or convincing or counts as a contribution. Um, but what things kind of failed for you? Think through whether you believe that these hypotheses are good tests of Schatz's theory. Second, do we see any of Nazarbayev's techniques at work in the United States today? Um, do we have um, any arenas in which the parties or media outlets or independent contractors are attempting to control the discursive technique or contempting, attempting to control what the public is discussing? taking moments that might mean one thing organically to the American public and trying to make them mean another. Um, this is the sort of stuff that you maybe could pull from the From article that we never got to discuss last week. But this is, you know, this is the sort of meat of Schatz's article if you are thinking about, you know, this is your last political science class. One of the things that you can use Schatz for is to compare um, to compare what happened in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan as we see the rise of populist parties in the United States and Europe today. Okay, so with this, I am going to close out um, this part of the lecture. I will post a new lecture for Blades or a new video for Blades and a new video for Gettys after this that you can watch, um, but otherwise this will be too long to upload to YouTube. All right, I will see you in the next video.